Okay, so good evening, Viva Ilta Paiva. Um, good evening. So um, now we start on the, uh, our live streaming from Tachmela Huvila here in Pispala, Tampere. I, I hope everything's okay with the microphones. It seems so. Um, this place um, is part of uh, Tampere Build Heritage Project, Pyrkanma Racken Mus Kultori Urtistus. And um, I have a little working place here, so I work on different projects. Uh, and at the moment, I have a small exhibition here um, about one of the fields where I'm working in. And um, maybe I can now introduce myself. So my name is uh, Alexander Lemke. And as I said, uh, at the moment I work here in Tachmen and Hubila. And mainly I do two things. One of these things is um, doing artistic research about Finnish sauna culture, but that's a completely different uh, topic. Um, and the other thing I've done during I think now the last 11 years, I have been working and living on Hulpovodet or Svalbard or Spitsbergen. And um, these images, which are represented here, are basically from my time when I was working there. And I was working there as an Arctic adventure guide. I was involved in several art projects. I was also involved in um, some photography projects and university projects. And um, these images are mainly from my time when I was either s working on sailing ships, expedition sailing ships, or when I was working as a snowmobile or um, hiking guide, either in summer or winter season. And now I'm very happy that we have our guest here. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Uh, my name is Satu Hassi. I'm a member of parliament since 91, <laughs> so since a long time, and living in, in, in Pispala. And well, uh, I think it's very interesting to have in uh, Tampere and in Pispala a German person who is interested in, in Finnish sauna culture. Um, uh, and uh, well, for example, you had a very interesting exhibition in the Finlayson area mm -hmm. some years ago about people, living people who have been born in, in sauna. But Alex is also uh, uh, photographing and, and documenting the chains in, in the Arctic areas, especially in, in Huippuvuoret, in, in Svalbard. And well, um, <coughs> as we know, uh, climate change is uh, uh, very visible in, in the Arctic areas because the uh, so-called high latitudes that are closer to either North Pole or South Pole, they are warming at least uh, two times uh, uh, more rapidly than, uh, than the planet, uh, or the average of the planet. And well, uh, I would like to ask you, how did you feel when, when you see uh, this change in the Arctic landscape? Uh, usually, this is a good question. I'm feeling uh, a little bit depressed and want to drink a vodka. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a little bit serious about that. We had an interesting uh, discussion just be before we were starting the streaming because Sato told me that she was visiting Longyearbyen in 1993. Yes, and then we yeah. were talking about uh, Avanto and ice bathing. And in 1993, this place was completely different. And coming back to what you just said, that the uh, mm -hmm. high Arctic is warming twice as fast. Actually, Longyearbyen, where you have been more than, or almost 30 years ago, mm -hmm. is now warming seven times as fast as any other place on the planet. So this is just a, a little detail. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, so I have been working as a, Arctic Adventure Guide, and um, it's a great experience because mm -hmm. I, I see the Arctic, uh, and uh, I'm, I really like to be in the nature mm -hmm. and spend time outdoors. And uh, the Arctic itself is quite fascinating. You have seen it mm -hmm. for yourself. But then, on the other hand, 
I also became more and more part of the tourism industry. And I would, so first time when I went there was 2008. And since that time it has totally changed. And um, especially during the last year, last years before the Corona times, there were more and more cruise ships coming. And I had a very sad moment, maybe a little story I want to tell. Uh, and um, that was, that was, um, I was working on a ship mm -hmm. and I was uh, quite close to Longyearbyen um, in the Eastfjord area in Nordenschild Bay, mm -hmm. Bukta. And uh, so I was working on a ship and uh, my work was over. So as a, as, an, as a guide or when you work on a ship, sometimes you, you can do some things which other people can't. So I just took a Zodiac on my own and I went uh, towards the glacier because I just wanted to be in the ice, have this quiet moment, listen to the ice, listen to the birds. And uh, then I had this very unique moment where suddenly uh, a, uh, a pot of beluga whales were swimming around me, briefing and, and um, fishing. And that was, is very, for all people who have experienced that, that's a very touching moment. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting in my Zodiac, it was absolutely quiet. There were only the sounds of nature. And then at some point I turned myself around and I saw uh, a sleeping seal on an ice float. And uh, one thing uh, what I do for my artists, I, I, I sometimes um, do these 3D audio recordings. So I want to capture soundscapes for myself. I want to listen to them. And uh, uh, there it's usually no noise pollution or light pollution. So I started to record these beautiful sounds. And then suddenly I started to hear this very deep uh, rhythmic sound, like boom, 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 boom. And then I already recognized what it was. And then I saw at the end of uh, Adolf Bukta, a big cruise ship, ship coming uh, towards me uh, and the sm very small ship I was working on. And so I had this big cruise ship coming in maybe four or five thousand uh, people. Then I had uh, a seal on an ice float and I saw and the air is so clean on Holper Wood that, that yeah, you, you never, when, when you have a cruise ship, you see these exhaust fumes much, much more. So the whole fjord, fjord started to fill with this ex exhaust fumes. There was the seal, I heard the belugas, the sound became louder and louder, and that was an absolutely shocking and uh, actually depressing moment for me. And it really made me thinking about this whole situation. Why is this cruise ship coming here? Then I also realized, but I'm also part of this mm. tourism industry. Uh, but I also think there's a difference between mm. sailing on a sailing ship, which is a very old technology, mm. it's very environmental friendly, and on the other hand, being on a cruise ship with thousands of other people. And there was some disco music playing on the on the top deck of the cruise ship. So, mm. uh, but it's it's a very complex topic. But it was usually it makes me very depressed because the changes I have seen in the last eleven years is is so difficult to grasp. Mm. Of course, you can read a magazine here in Finland about these are the numbers. It's so much warmer and whatever. Mm. But there's no personal connection to it. And I think mm. that's one of the biggest problems of climate change that we can't relate to it. But also, I think people in Finland, when they think about how it was as a kid, mm. then they start to develop mm, personal memories. And then they mm. see, of course, we are, we are also affected. But it's I it's very depressing thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, uh, there are um, uh, pairs of pictures, uh, for example, uh, from some uh, landscapes in the Alps, but also from some, some places in, in, in Svalbard. Uh, comparing the landscape a uh, hundred years ago and now and uh, the change in the amount of ice is really uh, dramatic but it's actually uh, even more dramatic if uh, a bit more than 10 years can can make a visible difference in 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 Svalbard and you mentioned uh, <laughs> uh, uh, comparing uh, what uh, we remember from our childhood, well, my childhood was long ago, <laughs> it, it was more than 60 years ago. But anyway, I remember that uh, the seasons were uh, 
fairly uh, similar uh, from the 50s to the 70s, but in the 80s it started to change. And now I think that, for example, uh, certain uh, uh, signs of um, spring, like the first green leaves, which we call hirenkorva, and some flowers like in the Finnish names Leskenlehti, Sinivuokko, and also the apple blossoms, uh, uh, they come at least uh, two weeks earlier than they used to come uh, still in the 80s. So we also see the difference, although it's not uh, maybe as dramatic as, as in Spitsburg. But you also have uh, witnessed uh, not just the impact of climate change there, but also uh, the plastic pollution. Could you tell a bit uh, about yes. that? Uh, so t talking about being depressed in Finland um, <laughs> in the winter. Uh, yeah. So of course there's my personal opinion and then there's science. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have been to really, really remote places uh, during my work as an mm -hmm. Ar Arctic ex expedition guide. I have been to North Ausland and maybe places where not so many tourists go. And actually, it really doesn't matter where you go. If, if you look on the map of Rupovoret uh, and Svalbard, where North Ausland is, mm. uh, it's just crazy because wherever you put your feet on land, even on Kvitoya, where I was able to land some years ago, which is a very unique thing. It's just polar desert, rocks and ice. Wherever you go, there's always plastic mm. at the beaches, mm. everywhere. And this plastic you see, that, that's a visual problem. It mm. doesn't look nice. As a tourist, you think, oh my God, this beautiful landscape is spoiled by the plastic. Mm -hmm. But actually, the plastic you see on the beaches, this is a very small amount. It's about 15%. Mm -hmm. The rest of the plastic is already in the sea. Mm -hmm. And there's no way we will get that out of the sea. Mm -hmm. So even if we might be able to kind of reduce our CO2 production, I think there's no chance to get that plastic out of the environment. And actually, we produce still more per year. Mm. We don't produce less. Mm. It's again a very complex topic. Plastic per se is not a bad material. Actually, it's a quite good material. But the way we use it, that, 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 that is the problem. Mm. One of the biggest problems of capitalism is that processes are not visible. Mm. You don't see what is necessary to eat your orange, mm. or why is this plastic cup so mm. cheap. Mm. You don't see they cut trees in the rainforest, they get oil somewhere out uh, in Canada off the ground, then they transport it to another place and make a plastic cup, and then you drink two minutes your coffee and then you throw it away. You don't see that. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, actually, uh, Olaf Lagerkrantz, who was uh, long time ago, the editor-in-chief of Svenska Dagbladet in, in, in Sweden. He wrote a book, uh, Min Första Kretz, my, my First Circle, was the name of the book. And there he, uh, he uh, uh, said that Osake uh, Yhtiö, like that type of, type of companies uh, which uh, we have now, doing business uh, that was a way to like separate uh, uh, your action uh, from the uh, like uh, 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 consequences so it uh, he said that it became a way uh, of for example murdering without seeing people yes. killed and today it's uh, very much like uh, polluting without seeing Yes. Uh, the po pollution. It's our imp yeah. imperial lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, it's really a problem that uh, the visible part of plastic in the ocean. It's it's only a small part. Uh, much bigger part is uh, uh, much deeper in the ocean, and also Everywhere, also, yeah. also has been eaten by all kind of uh, of marine life, including uh, including. Uh, eaten by us when we eat anything that comes from the sea. But, uh, well, uh, uh, anyway, your pictures are, 
are quite beautiful. So there is uh, like a very interesting uh, contradiction between these uh, beautiful scenes in the pictures and the beautiful scenes in, in the Arctic nature and these very worrying signs of climate change and, and plastic pollution among other things. So how do you feel about that? Of course, uh, this um, it's a little bit difficult to show now in the, in the stream, mm. um, but of course these images are beautiful images of the Arctic and actually uh, the, uh, I have other projects where I actually show plastic pollution mm. and I, I, I show uh, I, ice is melting. Uh, but these images, as I wrote in my little text here, are actually from kind of my private archive. Mm. And uh, these images I took for myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't produce them for exhibition. Mm. I really wanted to capture these moments for myself to keep them as a memory. Mm. So... Yeah, of course they are beautiful because if you are there, you are absolutely, it's a sublime experience. It's, it's, it's extremely breathtaking at times. It's like really magic uh, uh, place. So these images are beautiful, but um, I tried to break it a little bit because uh, if, if you um, uh, look at the images and see them, then I, I just was asking this one question, um, children of the North, what are you going to do? Mm. Uh, when the ice is gone. It's mm. like a very little sentence. And mm. uh, it's, I was also involved in some projects where we tried to find new ways to communicate uh, mm. climate change. Mm. And that is so difficult. And um, there's many possibilities and strategies. But uh, if you can talk to people on a pers personal mm. level, uh, if you don't make the problem too big mm. so that it seems you can't do anything mm. anymore, mm. Uh, then this usually is a good thing. But I don't believe in beautiful images and I don't believe in photographers, hundreds, thousands of photographers mm. who go to the Arctic and do exactly, shoot exactly the same image of polar bear mm. because exactly by that we destroy the Arctic. Mm. It's kind of very... Um, hypocritic thing. Mm. I'm mm. also part of this and, uh, and I'm aware mm. of that. Yeah. Well, I have been many times thinking that uh, possibly not enough people understand how small spot our planet is in the universe. So if we mess up with this uh, planet, if we uh, change it in a way that uh, it cannot support human societies anymore, there is no like rescue forces of, of, no. of, the, of the solar system or, or rescue forces of, of the universe to come and to save us. So, so basically we are living in a s spaceship and, and, and that should be like uh, the guiding, guiding thinking for us. And uh, <coughs> I also guess that uh, uh, for maybe uh, Normal, normal people who are not climate experts, it's, it's maybe a little bit like uh, difficult to understand uh, how, how a t a temperature change in global average temperature of uh, just a few degrees can, can make a really big difference. But because, for example, in Finnish winter, one day uh, the temperature can be zero and next day it can be minus 20. So uh, we are used uh, to very like uh, quite the big uh, temperature changes between uh, days. But uh, uh, if we look at the whole planet, if we would go to uh, four or five degrees colder than now, then we would be in the ice age. And uh, we would have two kilometers of ice, for example, on, on this place. The whole planet was quite different. Sea level was more than 100 meters uh, lower than now. So <coughs> I think that maybe illustrates that uh, also warming uh, with uh, a couple of degrees changes the whole planet to a, uh, to a different place. So in a way, we are on, on our way to an unknown planet, yes, and uh, and so uh, that's a thing which I hope people would understand. And we we don't have time to adapt. Maybe to give a very 
simple idea of a very complex problem. Um, so if you look on Google for climate change, mm -hmm. the most common images you find a polar bear on an ice float, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes even like really thin. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that in the Arctic, mm -hmm. but I see more often polar bears walking on land without snow or ice. Mm -hmm. Anyway, to show the complexity of this problem, mm -hmm. climate change and environmental change, so there's a lot of pollution, the dirty dozens, mm -hmm. plastic pollution mm -hmm. in the seas. So there's plankton, then there's fish who eat the plankton, then there's seals mm -hmm. who eat the fish, mm -hmm. and then uh, the polar bear is a top predator. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. eating the seals, so mm -hmm. actually he's accumulating these uh, pollutants uh, in his body, mm -hmm. in his body fat. Mm -hmm. So, and now to this, this complexity, so now there's less and less ice. So a polar bear has, uh, has to eat, let's say one seal a week to, to stay healthy. So he has to hunt on the ice. But when there's less and less ice, he has to cover greater distances. Mm. And then, which means that he has to use more of his body fat. Mm. Activates more of this body fat mm. means he mm. activates the pollutants, mm. which means the fertility rate mm. of polar bears, mm. and th that's very difficult to mm. show in an image, yeah. has dropped considerably. Mm -hmm. In some areas, yeah. there's uh, so much more birth mm. case of polar bears. Uh, it's just insane. Mm. And, uh, uh, and, and thi this is a very like, small thing, mm. but mm. it's so complex and everything is yeah. connected. And mm. what many people don't understand, we are not above nature and nature is not a supermarket. Mm. We are just part of nature mm. as any animal or any flower or tree or whatever. Yeah, that's true. Actually, when I was in the European Parliament for 10 years, I also arranged uh, an exhibition wa about climate change in the Arctic. And uh, the person who made the design uh, for, for the exhibition, she said that uh, if you want to uh, 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 like encourage people to protect uh, something, then you uh, have to try to make them love this thing. And anyway, I think that all this beauty in, in, in your pictures is in a way also like uh, an effort to create love to, to these uh, very vulnerable environments. Yes, uh, certainly I have fallen in love with this and mm -hmm. everyone else can fall in love mm -hmm. with it because it's so beautiful. But I really also ask myself, what are these images doing? Mm -hmm if more people are coming to the Arctic because they see certain imagery and have certain expectations. It's, it's again a complex uh, question. Mm, <laughs> but, yeah. but maybe now yeah. when we talk about images, now mm. could be a good time to show some of these images. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I probably am not able to see them. Or There's the live stream here, okay. Yeah, this is a, this is a very abstract image um, and that's just um, sea ice. Uh, I was on a snowmobile trip to uh, Monbukta uh, on the east coast of uh, Svalbard. And you can, in, uh, in the early uh, spring, you can go with your snowmobile even quite far on the sea ice, of course, you have to be careful because of uh, polar bears to not disturb them or even being attacked by one. And then there was this huge little uh, iceberg, which is sea ice. Uh, and uh, OK, now we are already the next image. C could you yeah, maybe go back? And this blue ice, many people ask me, yeah, this is, uh, this what, was there a lot of post-production done? But actually, no, because that, that is how it looks. I really tried to uh, uh, give my me like visualize my my memories, and um, there's a reason why it looks so blue. But maybe this goes now uh, too far from a scientific point of view. But it's so amazing to be in the mm -hmm. Arctic and and see this 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 really blue ice. Basically, water molecules in its solid and liquid form they um, absorb more mm -hmm. red and orange light patterns. So, mm -hmm. the deeper the ice, the more pure. Uh, uh, the more blue it appears, but that's a different. Mm, yeah, uh, it's the same thing with liquid water. If it's yes. really, really clean and deep, then yes. it looks blue. Yes. For the same reason. Yes, exactly. So now maybe we can go on. 
And yeah, this is a, this is a very uh, a typical um, Svalbard landscape. We were sailing, and this is uh, quite a big iceberg. And these icebergs, uh, some people don't know that, but this is not sea ice. So this ice is uh, coming from one of the many uh, glaciers on Svalbard. A little bit more than 60% of Svalbard is covered by, by ice. Uh, you have um, these so-called uh, Spitsbergen glaciers, so uh, large connected areas over the mm -hmm. mountains uh, uh, of, of glaciers. You have also some smaller valley glaciers, but this was a huge iceberg and we could sail uh, around it and it, it's moving. You can't go too close because that's dangerous and it's, it's amazing again because I'm also a sound uh, person, it's uh, the sound, this crackling of the ice, mm. these small sounds. It was a very quiet day. There was no wind, so we could only hear the ice. And uh, then uh, we switched off the engine of the mm. of the ship, and then it was absolutely silent. And it was very beautiful moment. It was a huge iceberg, but I think you can't see the birds to to give you scale uh, in the in the in this in the stream. But yeah, maybe we can uh, continue to the next image. Yes, uh, again, an image which is almost uh, for for myself, for my own memory at least, uh, as it was in in real. Uh, it's it's not so much post production. I did on a, I went on a snowmobile trip with a friend of mine and his wife. We went to a little hut uh, in Diabas Oden, which is maybe a couple of hours away from the from the settlement Longyearbyen on on Hulpewoorde and that was a more or less a private trip we spent some time there in this little hut and I was just standing at minus I don't know 30 something degrees with a big jacket uh, uh, and, and I saw these amazing colors and I was absolutely speechless I was on my own and I just looked at this uh, fjord ice fjord uh, uh, this is the mouth of Temple Fjord, and Icefjord is the biggest fjord system on on uh, Hulpovoret. And again, this is just absolutely brief taking to experience a moment like yeah. this. It's very so precious. It's a, it's a blessing actually. Which uh, month is this? Oh, this is uh, early March. Yeah, yeah. So it's like sun is rising in the yes, in the, <laughs> in yes. the north. Yeah. It's it's called the, um, the winter of light mm -hmm. uh, on Hulpovoret. It's yeah. very. It's these magic moments, and they last. They can last for a very long time. Mm. Uh, I mean, in Finland, these sunsets and sunrises are much longer than than in Germany, for example. Mm. But here, it's even longer because mm. of the yeah, yeah. Uh, position on on the planet. It's yeah, it's it's really amazing. Uh, yes, and yeah, again, this is uh, uh, another iceberg iceberg but a little bit uh, smaller and uh, you can also see uh, it's quite blue uh, but uh, it's uh, again quite calm sea and it was for me also so um, beautiful thing because we were sailing in the distance you can see you can see the mountains of, of Hulpa Wurde and then sometimes out of nowhere these icebergs appear and then they become bigger and bigger and bigger uh, uh, when you approach them. That's also why you always have to have someone on ice watch mm -hmm. uh, on the ship during the night when it's uh, later mm -hmm. in the year in September, October, when it's dark so that mm -hmm. you, you know all the story of Titanic. Mm -hmm. yes. this, this is of course not as big glacier, but um, yeah, sometimes they just appear and then you can yeah, just look at them for a long time and it's a very stunning thing to see. If you're lucky, sometimes you even have a polar bear or a seal on them. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Okay, maybe one more image and then we can maybe continue our mm. chat. Uh, mm. Yeah, and the very variety of light situation, moods, weather situations on, on Hulpo Wurat is just amazing and it can change within couple of minutes from sunny to snowy to storm to blizzard or foggy or whatever depending where you are you can go into a fjord you have completely different weather system and sometimes this is also very myst mystical and you can almost or you're not able to actually see anything at all mm -hmm. 
and then a mountain comes out of nowhere mm. or uh, again a, a landscape and um, yeah usually no words are needed in these situations mm. Mm. and I'm very happy actually when there are not so many people around clicking away with their cameras mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. only your camera <laughs> yeah but I can switch off my camera I'm yeah. not so crazy <laughs> we had guests on the ship was seven days trip and after seven days trip they had more than 30,000 digital images uh, that was just crazy mm -hmm. yeah but uh, yeah now maybe we can go back yeah and so to how, how much do we have time so uh -huh. yes yeah but so uh, uh i i think you might like have have a message with this exhibition so uh is uh, how how would you yourself crystallize your message i don't have a a big message or a small message but what i maybe have is what i'm doing myself because you can't change the world you can't do something climate change on a global scale it's just not possible it's too big for a single individual person so what i try uh, for myself uh, and that's the only thing i can tell i i try to uh, educate myself about certain things so what is needed to uh, eat my nice uh, avocado mm. in the middle of winter is this really a, a good thing? So I try to educate myself. Um, and when I think about it, I mean, even 30 years ago, we had all the knowledge, we had all the technologies, we had everything to cope climate change, but we didn't. Uh, and people always project this idea of a magic future technology, which will help us to cope climate change. This is just not going to happen because we have everything. So one thing is I try to educate myself and um, I think the most important thing for me is in my life, and I try to do that, to reduce um, the consumption of resources, to live as, um, yeah, like on a very small scale, which also means uh, nowadays uh, I really try to, to, to not fly because that's, that's a, a big thing. Also, one thing which many people don't know, so I think a, a German produces about 12, 13 tons of CO2 a year, including flying. Yeah, on average. Mm. Finnish person, a little bit less. Mm. But as an inhabit inhabitant of, of Hulbogur at Finnish, the university there made an analyzation or research project. It's something near to 190 tons per year. So uh, that's pretty crazy uh, because everything you consume there has to be brought by plane mm. more or less. Mm. So that's the CO2 footstep mm. of a person living there. Oh no. Yeah, that's a pretty crazy thing. Uh, yeah. So I also started thinking about mm. it. So I try to do small things, like choose the right food, uh, don't consume too much, try not to fly, travel uh, environmental friendly. So that's what I can do. But if I would have a message, uh, of course, this is a nice thing. And there's a big discussion, uh, especially amongst younger people about these things. And they do that. And, and that, that's our future. And that's our hope. But it also takes a little bit away. And that's the danger, because it's very comfortable for the big industries when people try to solve these problems for themselves. Maybe I still have a message, because we fucking have to make them responsible the big industries mm. because mm. when we, we talk about the big industries mm. that's that has much more impact on mm. co2 two production than we as individuals mm. so it's like mm. two things maybe yeah. a small thing and th maybe it's a big message yeah well i have two comments on that first uh, uh already when i was a teenager when we uh, uh, talked about uh, pollution uh, at that time we talked about pollution of lakes which was like much worse uh, in Finland at that time than than now uh, we talked about uh, uh, does it make a difference if I change my behavior this or that way and I started to think that um, 
uh, it's hopeless if we uh, think uh, uh, what percentage my action is from the like totality of what everybody uh, is doing or can do. But I, I can think about what, uh, what the things I'm doing, uh, uh, what percentage that is from those things that are in my, uh, in my hands. Uh, so um, I think uh, an individual also can also think that there are uh, uh, certain things that I can do, so uh, I can decide uh, to choose uh, <laughs> one or several of those things. Uh, um, so uh, uh, I feel that uh, then uh, I don't feel as hopeless. But uh, my other point is that the big difference comes from like big uh, <coughs> decisions in, in legislation, etc. So I have an example which is also linked to the polar regions. Uh, <coughs> when I was like a newcomer in, in, in politics, in lo local politics in Tampere in the 80s, uh, one of like, like the big uh, discussions of that time was uh, uh, what uh, so-called freons, which were used in spray uh, uh, bottles and also in uh, in uh, fridges uh, and, and 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 freezers and air conditioning equipment. What these uh, these were dis destroying the ozone layer, mm. especially in the in the polar regions. Uh, and I don't remember at that time that people would have started to discuss uh, should I like stop using my, my fridge. No, uh, an international uh, agreement was done uh, to ban production of these uh, chemicals. And it was implemented very quickly. And it was and, very effective. And, and it was really very effective. So the production of, of freons globally went down like this. And, uh, and if that wouldn't have happened, then we possibly wouldn't have any ozone layer anymore. And I don't know how livable this planet would be. So uh, this is a. a uh, like very successful example of, of a big decision that was made internationally and and also governments like implemented the things and uh, and uh, well of course the industry that was producing freons was fighting against uh, this uh, ban they said that it uh, oh, free cheese will come become terribly uh, like uh, expensive, etc. But that didn't happen. So uh, we need also like uh, big decisions of the society. And I think that it's also the responsibility of, of individuals to demand governments to do mm. that. It's the technology is there. It has been there for, for some time. Yes, that's very, I totally agree. Mm, it's su yeah. super important. Yeah, so I, I must say that myself, I'm like uh, all the time uh, uh, hesitating between like depression and, and optimism because, uh, well, uh, climate change is progressing uh, more rapidly than, than the forecast, but also technology is progressing more rapidly. So who would have believed that even in Finland now, so who would have believed 10 years ago that even in Finland now, when you uh, uh, invest in new electricity production, wind power is the cheapest option. And, and globally, almost in every country, solar power and wind power are the cheapest option now for new power production. So. And uh, one thing that gives optimism for me is that there is a rapid change also in in the financial market. Like big, uh, like financial players, like big banks and and pension funds, etc. Like like really the biggest players in in the money market. They have started to like phase out their. Uh, <coughs> Uh, fossil uh, shares in their portfolios and are like uh, demanding 
climate action from, from their clients. So it, change is going on. Uh, it has started. It's, it's, uh, it's going on, but uh, no one knows yet if the change uh, will be rapid enough to, to make this, uh, keep this planet livable for, for human societies. Yes. So, sorry mm. for preaching. Uh, no, no. A, li a little bit, uh, I think, is needed. Maybe I have a small prayer then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Because please. I have been here now for a while in my working room, and uh, I, I enjoyed many nice soups. But uh, I also enjoy Pispala, of course, because it's a very beautiful place. And there's uh, Pyrjärvi, it's the beautiful nature here. And there's uh, close to this uh, old um, wooden building, uh, there's the lake and the lakeside. So I spent there uh, in my breaks in summer when I was working. I just went there looking at the lake, relaxing a little bit. And then I started to realize, holy fuck, there is so many cigarette bums. And what is wrong with the people? Because cigarette bums are made of acryl, basically the same stuff your glasses are made of when it's not the metal frame. And this place is full and I started to collect these. And my record was in a very small spot, 86 cigarette bums a day. And it's everywhere in Pispala. It's mm. at Tachmelan Beach. Uh, mm. It's lying around everywhere. And uh, this is so poisonous and it's so uh, uh, dangerous. And I just don't get why do people throw them away? It's made that it looks like paper, but it's not. It's plastic. Mm. It lasts a couple of hundred years until it's going away. Mm. And this is maybe a small message. I was really collecting crazy amounts of this stuff. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And it's everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's irritating, but it's also poisonous. That's true. But uh, I think that uh, this winter, when we have had uh, real snow and real ice, uh, which in last winter, we di last year, we didn't actually have a real winter. So, uh, and I remember last year, people were uh, complaining about uh, November that doesn't end at all. So we we moved uh, directly from no uh, November to to March mm. one year ago. This year we have had a real winter with with ice and snow, and people have been able to walk and, and ski also on on the Lake Pyhäjärvi. So I think uh, I hope that uh, this winter when we have had the chance to enjoy uh, like Arctic winter uh, with snow and ice. Uh, uh, I hope this also helps us to like uh, appreciate uh, uh, the whiteness uh, of, of Arctic winter and, 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 and to act to protect it and to, and to keep it. Yes, uh, yes. I, I also enjoyed this winter and it made me think about my childhood when I had also real winters in Germany, be Germany but nowadays any longer and I also realized on a personal level how beautiful it is mm -hmm. to have real winter. And now we have uh, a few questions from, from the audience, mm -hmm. I think, to both of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, one question is, uh, how do you feel about tourism from, from an environmental point of view? And I have been to the Arctis. Mm -hmm. I'm a tourist myself in the beginning. I have been a tourist myself in the beginning and I went there because I like the place and it's beautiful. Most of the time I was working on a sailing ship and I was hiking, which is a very sensitive way. Small ships, maybe 30, 30 guests or even smaller ships. Mm -hmm. You have lots of time to observe nature, to tell people, so people something about nature. So I think it's kind of a very sensitive uh, way of tourism, but I also still had to fly there at times. I was not always on a sailing ship. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also good to, to educate people about the Arctic. Everyone has the same right to go there. So I think this is sensitive way of tourism is a good thing. But if I look at these crazy cruise ships, they are not only polluting the air, they're bringing like these uh, invasive species and it's kind of closed systems. People care only about three meals a day and they don't know where they are actually when they step off the cruise ship and then they want to consume on the cruise ship 
and they want to consume in, in the place where they are going. They want to, to, to buy some silly souvenirs. Uh, and I think this kind of tourism, this, these ships which are bigger and bigger so that more and more people can afford it, that's an absolutely bad thing which is, puts a lot of stress on the Arctic, even more stress on the Arctic mm. environment. And uh, I'm actually totally against it. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's uh, tourism is also a question of scale. So it, uh, uh, the thing that uh, middle class people in Europe and, and USA uh, consider it's, it's normal to, to fly to the south at least once a year, uh, the time that has been considered normal is very short. So uh, I think uh, traveling uh, is important because it helps us to like understand uh, people elsewhere but I think that we uh, much bigger part uh, of our traveling should happen nearby and 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 via, via land uh, <coughs> so uh, and and therefore I also hope that uh, rapid uh, train connections are developed both uh, uh, in uh, in European countries and, and between European countries. So, for example, I, th I, I, I would love if we would have someday um, have a night train from Helsinki to, to Berlin, for example. Uh, <coughs> and and uh, I think that uh, for human life to, to fly somewhere very far away once a year or more rapidly, that's, that's really not... Uh, not a necessity. Uh, of course, technology is helping also there. Uh, uh, the car market is uh, very uh, soon ch uh, rapidly changing. The cars are electrifying. Uh, electricity power production uh, becomes cleaner. Uh, uh, making ships clean uh, is, is a bit more difficult, but I think it's, uh, it's doable. Uh, it's more difficult to make flights clean, especially if uh, flying is as massive as we are used to before the corona pandemic. So uh, I think uh, to become sustainable, we need to like uh, go to a smaller scale of tourism, but also change, uh, change the methods. Yes, ab absolutely. And you can have many beautiful small-scale adventures in front of your door. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think that many things last summer, when it was difficult or impossible to travel abroad, um, started to like uh, finding uh, really uh, fascinating things in, in yes. Finland. Yes. Um, and there's another question which I really like, actually. Mm. It's an interesting que question. It's what would you say to a person who would like to go to Svalbard to have an adventure? I would say just go there, have your adventure. Because it's beautiful, just think about the way how you do it. And if you want to have a kind of recommendation how to do it, I would say if you have a sturdy stomach, uh, you just uh, find one of the boats going from Tromsø to Longyearbyen, and you work as a deckhand, uh, or you sometimes get free passage. So then you have your adventure, uh, especially on the smaller sailing ship, there's s sailing ships. There's uh, some options. You have your adventure. It's qu pretty environmental friendly, uh, and then you go to to Svalbard. You go to Longyearbyen. You can uh, go hiking. You book yourself uh, a guide up there. There's uh, I have two great friends here from Pispala, uh, Jesse and Reine. They also work there as adventure guides. You can book them, and uh, then you go on a little hike with these guys. And this is uh, a, a very nice way to experience the nature, and you will have your adventure. Don't fly there. So, but everyone has the right to go there. So, just think about how. Yeah. Thanks. The first uh, efforts to go to Svalbard uh, were in uh, like Kuma Ilmapallo. What's that in English? Uh, but these were not not successful. Those people unfortunately died. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's that. That of course the mm. safety thing is is mm. another topic mm. on, uh, mm. on 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 Svalbard. Yes. Mm. Um, is there? 
Are there any other questions? Questions now? Okay, one more. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, one thing the corona pandemic has taught us that uh, although uh, uh, modern <clears throat> societies uh, in Europe and, and Northern America and, and in some other parts of the world are technologically very advanced, we are, uh, we are anyway vulnerable. So a small virus which is so small that with a uh, classical optical microscope, you don't see it. You need an uh, um, electron microscope to, to see the virus. Uh, 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 that virus can like uh, put uh, our our like mighty societies on on our knees. And uh, and I th uh, hope that people also understand this message linked to climate change. So if we mess up this planet, uh, then uh, it's us who, who suffer from that. And uh, <coughs> that's like uh, the biggest thought I have from the uh, corona pandemic. Uh, but another thing is that people have learned uh, new ways of doing things. I believe that, for example, distant meetings via video connection uh, will be part of normal life also after the corona pandemic. Mm. So not all meetings, but a bigger part of meetings, both uh, like uh, local meetings and national meetings and, and international meetings. Uh, so it, uh, I believe it will not be uh, considered anymore like necess necessary to travel to, to every meeting. Uh, <coughs> And, and, and also, I hope that people who have realized that there are really fascinating places nearby, uh, near their homes, uh, where they can go for, for the lesser time, that uh, they like remember this and, and continue doing this uh, also after we are vaccinated and, and the pandemic is, is overcome. Yes. Uh, this this is a very good point, but I'm 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 also a little bit skeptic that uh, things will change after the pandemic. I think as soon as everyone has vaccination, quite a few people will also pretty fast go back to normal. So, uh, uh, which means if the new next iPhone is released, they will buy it. <laughs> so we still have a lot of yeah work yeah. Uh, work to do. But yeah. of course, these technologies they they help. I mean, and if we if we don't have to fly from Helsinki to Denmark to take part in a, in a meeting or something, that's already quite a big thing. Mm -hmm. I yeah, yeah. I don't believe that everything will change, but uh, I, I believe that some issues will, will uh, like become normal. And I hope that there will be like many, many of the practices we have learned to do uh, uh, will become normal, but well, we will see it. And, but I like, uh, First of all, I, I hope that people remember this lesson given by the coronavirus, that humans are not masters of, of universe. We are part of the nature, and, and if we treat the planet and the nature in a bad way, then it, it hits us also. Mm. Okay, um, I think this was almost an hour. Uh, <laughs> And if there's no more question, I think uh, we both have talked uh, quite quite a bit. So um, yes, I I hope this was an interesting uh, discussion. It was definitely for me, oh. and uh, it's interesting that we yeah, shared this short uh, moment uh, of Longyearbyen in the beginning, which we I think both didn't know of each other. So we had immediately uh, a, a kind of good point 
where we could connect. Um, and yes, again, I hope this was interesting for everyone in, involved. Because of Corona, uh, we don't know um, yeah, uh, how it will go. So I think at the moment this place is not so accessible as, as, as usable. But um, let's... Yes, the pictures are here uh, in the in the cafe cafeteria, so you can uh, come and have some really nice cake, actually very good cake, <laughs> and good coffee. Uh, unfortunately, the shelf is now empty. Anyway, you can come here and uh, um, uh, see the images. Uh, also on my webpage Spitzbergen.photo, you can see uh, more stuff. The saunaproject.net is my other web page where all my sauna related work is uh, visible. But uh, maybe I'm talking too much. Maybe you would also like to say something. <laughs> well, end. well, thanks. Uh, I just uh, would like thank you for this, uh, for sharing these beautiful photos with us. And I, I, I wish you all the best. And I hope that also this exhibition and, and your work as a whole is uh, is uh, one of the many many things that are needed to change uh, change the thinking of people to help uh, all people on on the planet to start uh, uh, both uh, demanding uh, climate action from the governments and and doing all kinds of uh, more sustainable choices in in their private lives yes I hope the same. So, yeah. Kitos, Balian. Kitos, and all the best. <laughs>